Hello, and welcome back to Behind the Post. My next guest is the head of social media at S&P Global, a leading provider of transparent and independent ratings, benchmarks, analytics, and data to the capital and commodity markets worldwide. Christina sat as the head of social for S&P Global Market Intelligence, a division of S&P Global for four years before being promoted to the head of enterprise in June of 2022. She now manages a global team with members in North America, Europe, and Asia. Christina works remotely at her home in Memphis, Tennessee, where she lives with her husband and two daughters. Without further ado, please welcome to the show, Christina Thomas. Christina, are you ready to go behind the post with me? I am. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, of course. I am so excited to be sitting down with you today. And I, you are just so experienced and I'm really excited to pick your brain and really dive into social strategy and all the things. Um, but before we dive deep, I'd love to know um, how you kind of ended up at s &P. Could you just give us a brief background of your professional journey? Oh, yeah, for sure. So um Back in my youth, so I'd say, honestly, I wasn't that young, but I really thought I was going to be on Broadway and there, there is relevance. So I was a musical theater major at a college in Florida for a while and like truly believed that that's what I was going to do. Like really thought I was going to be on Broadway. <laughs> and um, anyways, long story short, I came down from that cloud and ended up getting a degree in PR and um, got an internship at a video production company. And I was like, okay, this is kind of cool because I can still do the acting element because they let me do like some on-camera stuff. Mm -hmm. Plus I can learn, you know, the ins and outs of production and I can take advantage of my degree, which was in PR. And so I loved it. And after my internship, I ended up getting a job there. And where social media comes into play is because typically social media would defaults or it used to default to the youngest person in the office, which I was, um, people were spending a lot of money creating videos and they were spending bukus of money placing those videos on networks like NBC or CB, you know, CBS, whatever. They're spending a ton of money on placement on media buys. Mm -hmm. And so one of the, you know, selling strategies at the production company at the time was, okay, well, how can we convince people that it's still worthwhile to spend money on video, even if you can't afford the placement? And that's where social media came in. And so that was kind of, now I'm not going to say the beginning of YouTube, but that was when, you know, YouTube and Facebook and all these platforms in terms of B2B marketing were definitely in their infancy. And so I feel like I kind of got in on the ground floor specifically with promoting video on social media. And a lot of times it was, you know, mainly organic, but when I left the production company, I actually ended up going to work for a nonprofit and I ended up managing pretty much all their digital media. And that is when I got into the more paid aspect of social media and became a total nerd for it. And um, yeah, so the goal there was to help promote uh, the, it was very random, it was the Hardwood Lumber Association. <laughs> yes, I know. Thank you. I live in Memphis. It is the hardwood capital of the world. <laughs> Fun facts. Um, anyway, so I they had a trade school that we would promote. Um, and in order to try to get people to enroll in the trade school, we thought, okay, let's try some paid social to target people. And that's what we did. And that's kind of how I got my my foot in the door with social. Oh, wow. And then from there, I worked for the nonprofit for a while. And then my husband got a job in Charlottesville, Virginia. I didn't know a single soul there. And <laughs> this is a true story. I'm sitting in the airport and I'm like, okay, I'm working from home. I need to make friends. I was pregnant at the time. I was like, okay, I got to get like some social interaction. And I'm at the airport about to go home to Memphis. And I look up and I see a sign for S&P Global. And I was like, what was that? And so I look up on my phone and it's obviously one of the biggest uh, biggest companies in Charlottesville. And I saw that they were hiring for a marketing manager at the time, applied on a whim, got the job, ended up being one of the best things that ever happened to me. I made a ton of amazing friends in Charlottesville working for S&P. And then um, pandemic hit, everybody went to work from home. Um, at that time, I was working for S&P Global Market Intelligence, which is a division of S&P Global, obviously. And I went from being a marketing manager to heading up their social. And I was their head of social for about three years. And then recently in 2022, was promoted to the head of social for S&P Global Enterprise. Wow. That is fascinating. Talk about right time, right place, and that's right opportunity. <laughs> yeah, yeah for sure. wow. I love that. And I love the backstory and also that you have background in video. I feel like that 
you probably utilize that every day in your role. So that's super interesting. So curious, are you a team of one? Do you have a team under you? What does your role kind of entail at S&P? So each of the divisions have social teams. And then at the enterprise level, I have a social team of four. So it's me, I'm in Memphis, Tennessee, and then I have Abby in London. I have Saigor, who is in Malaysia, and then I have Arsalan in Canada. So we are a global team um, and we can support from a global angle, which is pretty great. Amazing. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I am so excited to dive in and you have a very impressive background and I'd love to know from your perspective, where do you think that B2B organizations are missing the mark on social today? So I think that in terms of missing the mark, I think that it's just one of those, I think it's when you're a large corporate brand like S&P Global, it is, and if you've gone through a merger like we have recently, um, you obviously want to be very focused on your brand and pushing that brand awareness. However, especially in an industry like the finance industry, which isn't always known as the most exciting of industries, um, it's challenging to stay within that brand, but also still create compelling content. Yeah. So how can I, you know, for example, I mean, I think TikTok videos come up all the time and it's like, would that be relevant for us? Would it not? And obviously, you know, from an outsider looking in, it's like, no, that wouldn't be relevant for us. But it, my argument is that if people are talking about us on a platform, we need to be on that platform. Mm-hmm. We need to have our own messaging combating whatever messaging is being put out there or complimenting it depending on what it is and so you know trying to find a way to stay within brand but I guess make it a little more flexible a little more personality and a little more fun um Mm -hmm. while also kind of keeping the for lack of a better word vibe of the industry if that makes sense so I think that making really compelling content but also staying within brand is challenging and I also think it's a little challenging to make very unexciting at times content exciting Mm -hmm. um so you know there are definitely some some hurdles when it comes to that yeah I completely agree and I think especially for you in the finance industry like how are you actually going in and making your content engaging like on the post level are there certain things you're doing to sound more human and authentic or are you switching up your content types like what are you doing to be engaging and foster community. Could you share just like a couple of tips and tricks? Yeah, of course. So to make it a little more engaged. So I'm very lucky, I will say, because I work for a company like S&P Global, which means I have content creators all over the place because we have editorial teams and we have content teams and that is literally their job. And so I have all of this amazing content and thought leadership at my fingertips. And so it's like, I get to come in and see like, Ooh, look at all the options and then get to decide and get to, you know, work with my team and the, the internal teams to decide what we promote and what images to put behind it. Um, Typically in order to, we've seen that the most engaging posts are ones that have charts or graphs that come from our articles. That's what people engage most, most with. And that's where we get the most engagement. So For example, we try to pull out images, charts, any visualization that we can that will hopefully spark conversation. And that typically works. And when the conversation is sparked, we try to get the authors themselves to respond to these comments so that if someone's saying like, hey, where'd you get that data? Then we try to have our authors engage with it. And so um, basically how about really what we're doing to become more personal, I would say, is we are opening the doors to more departments, I think, to post on our channels, um, including focusing a lot on people's stories and putting faces behind the names of our thought leaders and our authors and our executives. Mm -hmm. Also encouraging our executives to post more um, so that, you know, because they also, they have their own presence as well. Yeah. Um, so that's a lot of what we're doing. And then we have a big social selling program where we go in and we um, basically train the commercial teams or the the sales orgs and the marketing orgs across the different divisions on how to use social media to sell or to promote the brand. Um, you know, it's, it's employee advocacy, but it's also um, just trying to get people to be more comfortable speaking on platforms like LinkedIn and speaking as experts because we have so many experts around the company. Um, And then when, you know, as they engage and as their networks grow, that then helps our network grow and, you know, so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. Wow. That is fascinating. And I, I was actually surprised when you said that that kind of content performs the best, the graphs, because that's not what you would think all the time. Like, especially on social media, everyone's just trying to 
be authentic and engage in their in with their audience in a meaningful way. And it's so true that there's no one size fits all strategy for every like for everyone. And I love that you found what worked and you stick with it and you're creating that conversation. You're not just spewing content at your audience and just hoping that they engage back. So I love that. (laughs) And I feel like anybody that works in the social media industry will get this. It's like anything that I think is going to be just so engaging and it's really going to hit and like we'll put a lot of money behind it and a lot of time it just falls flat on its face. And then something that we might like rush to get out and kind of not a big deal to us all of a sudden is our top performing thing for Mm -hmm. whatever reason. And I think for us, um, our strategy really has to be timeliness and relevance. See, so, you know, we have to stay on top of what is trending in each industry and make sure that we are posting content relative to relative to that. Um, And I think that that is obviously, um, one of our biggest indicators of success is are we posting content at the right time? Yeah. Are we posting content when people care about it or are we posting it two or three days later and everyone's already yeah. kind of digested everything and it's old news. Um, so I think that, you know, our strategy of timeliness and trying to get that content out as quickly as possible has helped a little mm-hmm. bit too. Do you find that it's challenging to kind of keep up with the content? Because obviously we, we love to plan And then you make a plan, you create your content. Like I like to create my content a week in advance, but the content that I plan is almost never the content that goes live because stuff pops up. So how do you kind of balance that? I, cause I know I find it really challenging. So how are you doing that? I cry a lot. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Um, I honestly, I just, I always... (laughs) I don't know if anyone's going to get this, but I'm always like pivot, 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 the friends joke, you know, and that's really what it is, is like, you just have to keep pivoting and be flexible. And Mm -hmm. so I kind of, I go into, you know, our social media management tool and I just kind of, it's like, to me, it can, it's kind of like Tetris. It's like, okay, this here, I can move that there was, is this relevant for this time zone? Okay. You know, and you you kind of make it work and you do have to make changes based on what's happening. You Mm -hmm. know, one of the best examples I can think of is, um, Blackout Tuesday around the death of George Floyd. You know, you could have had all the social plans in the world that day, but because everyone went dark on social media as we should have, Mm -hmm. um, those plans kind of went out the door and everything had to to pivot. And so that's just, that's just how it is. And that's the nature of social media. And that's why that's really what keeps it so fun. I think. Yeah. I was actually just writing a post um, today, actually about how the role of B2B social media managers is often misunderstood because from the outside looking in, you think, oh, they're just posting on LinkedIn, but there is so much that goes on behind the scenes. And we have the pressure of being the voice of our company. We need to have a pulse on everything that's going on because we could so easily damage the image of our company if we don't know what's going on and we post the wrong message at the wrong time there's a lot at risk and that's a lot of pressure. And I don't think people really realize that. So I'm, I'm you really can sound, that you can sound tone deaf really easily because yeah. any content can be turned any different way. And so a lot of times we have to play better safe than sorry. And I think the other piece of that to your point is not only is it the pushing out of content, but people don't realize we're also the eyes on social media. Mm-hmm. And so the social listening piece of it is huge. Yeah. You know, it's our responsibility to make sure that there are no conversations happening that we aren't a part of that could be a risk to our brand. And a lot of times we don't even know about PR issues or PR um problems until we get that first tweet and I'm like what and then you you know you're kind of it's a sprint to the finish line those are exciting days but they're also extremely stressful especially when you work for a company like S&P that is making very large decisions um every single day so we're constantly kind of on the defensive when it comes to the social listening aspect of it yeah and you have to be that's the best way to go about it Um, And I I want to talk about something that you mentioned earlier, um, going through a merger. So that's something that I have not experienced myself. And I would love to know from your experience in social, how did that impact your strategy? Um, Was it like craziness going on? Or like, how did you kind of pivot and kind of continue on with your strategy? So the truth is I'm still figuring it out. (laughs) Um, And I took over this role in June of 2022 and the merger happened in January. So that was six months of my predecessor's team 
doing a lot of organization and planning around that. And I think that they did a great job. Um, so the the first thing that, you know, really what their role was, was they focused a lot on the day one. How would that messaging go? How would we announce that the merger was complete and all these things? I kind of picked up from day two and beyond, let's put it that way. And it's not as easy as you would think. You know, both of these companies, they were, these were two massive companies that had two separate brands, two separate internal processes, two separate external processes, two separate everything. Yeah. And so I had to come in and take a look at the entire landscape and one, figure out how to get everybody on the same internal processes so that we were all working in the same tools. Um, and then also working to rebrand the accounts that need to be rebranded, decide which accounts need to be sunset, but then laying out a plan and a timeline for sunsetting those and how quickly we do it. Um, mm -hmm. Working with the different platforms to determine, can we merge here? Can we not? Because fun fact, guys, if you hear no once, just ask mm -hmm. again, because you never know. I'm pretty yeah. good at getting, <laughs> getting what I, I'm Love pretty that. good at being a little bit annoying, but um, <laughs> you know, figuring out where you can merge things. I mean, honestly, one of my biggest challenges has been um, with YouTube. Because okay. we had these two YouTube channels and one had a lot of subscribers, one had some subscribers, wasn't growing as much. And so I was like, okay, I kind of want to take advantage of the one with the more subscribers. However, that's not the brand that we're going into the market with. Okay. So I got to figure out how to get videos off of this one over here somehow sunset this one, but I still need that URL and that name. So I'm going to have to delete you and pray to God, I can take that URL and name and put it on the the next channel. And so, you know, a lot of it is trial and error and it's a lot of scary trial and error, but at the same time, um, we're doing a lot of testing. And so if I'm like, if, if I have a hypothesis that something is going to work, then we are going to create dummy accounts, try it out and then implement it on our side. But yeah, it is, it is challenging to determine kind of what you want to move forward with, because to that point also, there were two, you know, main brand company pages and they had about the same followers and you really can't merge company pages completely. So determining which one yeah. of those to keep. And so, I mean, it's a lot of decisions and we're still kind of making them on the fly. There's a lot of products that came over in the merger um, or that were combined in the merger that are being sunset and things like that. And so just, did, you know, trying to stay on top of the company's decision, but also paying attention to what the market is saying to us. And if our decisions are confusing them even more or not, because really the end of the day, the goal is brand awareness, because that's mm -hmm. what we need to focus on. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sure it's still an ongoing process. And yeah, you know, when you're in the social media role, you have to be an expert in your company. And that's also a lot of pressure to being the voice of your brand, like I was just saying. Um, and I would love to know how, how do you, I know we kind of talked about like balancing like content requests, um, but I'm sure there are a lot of requests from different departments that want to be featured on your corporate page. How do you go about that? Because I know us social media managers and professionals, we, we have our own strategy and content that we know that we need to share. Then we also have requests from different departments. So how do you kind of mesh the two together? So I don't know if this is going to be a popular answer, but this is the truth. I, I try not to say no to anybody. So I can't guarantee that I'm going to post your stuff that week. But for example, we have PRG groups, which are, which are uh, basically like internal clubs, so to speak, around different topics. Um, so for example, Valor is one of ours, which is our, our veterans group. And so if they want to put a post out, obviously I want to support them and post yeah. it. I might not be able to do it the week of the world economic forum in Davos, but I'm definitely want to get it out at some point. So my point is, and to say that is I try not to say no, I try to figure out, even if it's, uh, I try to figure out what content needs to go where. So I might not allow something to land a spot on LinkedIn or on the Instagram grid, but you can have a story, yeah. you know, and the goal really has to be to drive traffic somewhere. What is our goal? What are we trying to do? Anything that we publish needs to have the goal of honestly driving traffic or increasing our brand awareness in some way. So as long as you're 
post or your content kind of checks all of our internal boxes in terms of brand and things like that, then we try to find a way to make it work. We also uh, like to take advantage, a lot of advantage of organic uh, targeting. So making sure that we're serving up specific content to those right audiences because S&P Global spans so many industries and we do have so much content. I could literally post every second of every single day probably, yeah. but um, obviously we can't post that often. So trying to make sure that I'm serving up the right content to the right groups. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this might not be the easiest question to answer, but with all of that content and with, you know, so many departments and so much content to manage. How are you measuring success? So right now, the best way I can answer that, because again, we just came off of a merger. So it's like, what are we basing our success off? Are we basing it off of one company or the other or the combined company? So right now, I'm just looking at year over year, month over month improvement. And mm -hmm. then once I hit kind of of that one year mark of feeling like I've had this under my belt, then I feel like I'll have a better idea of the true benchmarks that I want to focus on. But I don't feel like, you know, pulling financial industry benchmarks, that's not going to give me the benchmark I'm looking for. I want to make sure that I am continual, continually improving, especially yeah. on the organic side. Mm -hmm. So um, if I can see that followers are going up, then obviously my other metrics ideally should be going up as well. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not seeing that month over month, then I know that we need to make some changes in whatever content that we're serving up or however we're doing or yeah. whatever hashtags we're using or anything that we're doing to expand the reach of our content. Mm -hmm. I think that is great advice. And that is, I measure the same thing too. And I think that's such a good way to make sure that you are growing and track spikes in engagement. So you know that if you did have a really good month or this month is performing way better than like the month previous in the previous year, you can go in and see like what kind of content is contributing to like an increase in engagement. And then you can continue to replicate that content down the line. So amazing. I do uh, feel like that is probably one of the biggest challenges though, is, is, getting everybody on across an enterprise as large as ours, everyone on the same reporting structure and methodology, because I don't know if you follow work and social, they said on yes. Instagram, it's pretty oh, amazing. Yes. And, you know, my social metrics are between me and God. Like yeah. that is such a real thing because different platforms pull metrics in different ways. And so what is your engagement? Does it include clicks? Does it not, you know, so kind yeah. of, that's why I feel like the month over month improvement is such a, is a, is a really good um, yeah. indicator of that. And I also, I also try to look at each account and platform individually to track growth mm -hmm. there, not just the overall numbers. Yeah. And it's important to know who you are communicating this data to, because they might be, they might have a totally different mindset around social media data and insights. And sometimes we don't always speak the same language. So it's also important to be able to create a story around your data. So it makes sense to whoever you're speaking to or reporting that to. Yeah. And less is more when it comes to that, because a lot of stakeholders, they don't have time to sit and read through yeah. your metrics glossary. They just want to know, okay, is this performing well? And so really when it comes to that, to, I think that measuring, you know, depending on what your goal is, which I said before, our goal is to drive people to the website as much as possible. Mm -hmm. I like to look at social website traffic as a really great indicator of success too, because yes, I can look at the clicks and impressions and all those things, which are very helpful, but I really want to see the impact to the website. And if that mm -hmm. percentage of social traffic is not increasing month over month, then I'm not doing my job. That's how yeah. I feel about it. Yeah. And then you have to intervene and come up with a strategy. So it's yeah. always important to have an eye on all aspects of social, even the data, which is sometimes not the fun part of it, but exactly, it's probably the most important. Um, well, look, we're nearing the end of the show here and I have one final question to ask you that okay. I ask all of my guests. And that is, what is one thing you wish your colleagues and other departments knew about working in social media? It's not easy. <laughs> and I'm not like, I am not sitting on my phone, like, chewing bubble gum and listening to Britney Spears, which, okay, sometimes I am, but <laughs> most of the time that's not what I'm doing. Um, and that yeah. it is a hard job and it does involve a lot of strategy. And honestly, I would say that um, the social media team needs a seat at pretty much every table. Yep. Um, I do feel like that social media, a lot of times is an afterthought. Yes. Like, oh, we should get this on social, you know, mm -hmm. after they've done all the planning for the other channels and it, it needs to be included in your initial planning. So, yes, yeah. you are preaching to the choir here because I couldn't agree more. And 
I feel like everyone that works in social, we're all kind of fighting for that seat at the table because from the beginning of campaigns, we need to be brought in so we can understand the process and we have our own strategy. And if we're not looped into that conversation and it just gets thrown at us the day it needs to go live, we already have our own content and we're, we already have a whole story for the month or whatever the theme is. Like we have so much that's going on. And when we're just pinged, Hey, can you get this out today? It's just, Oh, it, it yeah. breaks our hearts. It's, it's hard. We're but. not sitting and waiting. And I used to use the, yeah. it's like, honestly a terrible analogy but social media is the rash so basically like you can feel like crap for days and then all of a sudden you're like I don't know what's going on but all of a sudden you have this massive rash on your face and you're like oh my gosh okay I think I need to go to the doctor social is the rash so until something is like published and live on social people don't care and then as soon as you know other eyes can see it or that someone starts sharing a link then it's a problem and so I try to say like let's go to the doctor before we get the rash mm -hmm. exactly <laughs> I love that analogy <laughs> well look thank you so much for being here today I am so excited to share this out because first you're hilarious and I know oh, thank you. I'm going to love this episode and I just love how how many insights you shared so thank you so much for joining me Thank you. I loved it. Thank you.